Henry, what an honor, man, to sit down with a legend like you. We have a new album on the horizon. Yes. How are you? It's out today, man. Yeah, dude. It's going to be awesome. How are you doing now that it's out? Good, good. Yeah, feeling relieved. You know, uh, Brainchild number 13 is out. So it's a good feeling. Response is really good. So, yeah, I'm happy about it. Your singles too, man. The singles that you dropped and just the videos, Rat Kingdom, the Judas Paradox, everything has, like, just been amazing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Yeah, you know, we try to do the best we can. And uh, I think the the videos are quite nice. It's beautiful Mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yeah, what can I say? I mean, I'm not objective anymore. I should ask you, you know, <laughs> dude. Well, real quick, could you give us a, like a, just a brief history of what this journey's been like? Oh, I, I founded the band in 1990. Um, so we exist like 34 years today. Um, we've done 13 albums now, including the one that came out today. Uh, we're a blackened death metal band. Um, we were assigned to Metal Blade for 25 years. Now we switched to Raining Phoenix music. And um, we're going on tour in September in Europe with Ultimas and Batushka. And we're heading over to the US uh, next year, March. Awesome. Oh, I have to catch you when you come here. Absolutely. Dude, so this new album, man, it it just dropped. Was there was there anything about this new album that you wanted to explore that you haven't on previous albums? Well, we want to explore something new on every album. We never make the same album twice. Uh, we have the habit of making a new album completely different than the one before and the ones before that. Mm-hmm. Um that goes for the music it goes goes for the lyrics uh so it's like all original stuff that we haven't done before and uh it has the god dethroned signature but we don't work according to a blueprint let's say the bloody blasphemy was a breakthrough album and now we're going to do all the albums like the bloody blasphemy we don't work like that we want to keep it fresh and uh and new for for the fans so they can expect something completely different different every time the the title man i really being being somebody of uh i i grew up in a, an extremely religious household and oh. um and uh so obviously a lot of the terminology and everything kind of resonates from my own history of life i i really do like the title of this latest album the judas paradox and I know that you are like an avid history buff. Like you, you dig in to like all the nooks when you're creating in your creative process. What what is the what is the Judas paradox? Well, the Judas paradox was my idea about Judas. And my question: Could he be innocent? Was he just a scapegoat? So I started doing research. And I found out that there's two stories in the Bible about Judas Iscariot. One story is the story that everybody knows. And the other story uh, goes uh, that Jesus could look into the future, could see that he would be killed to be able to return as king of the world. And that Judas was the chosen one to fulfill this task, which makes Judas innocent because he didn't act in free will. And that's what this, that's what the song is about. So it's based on the second story in the Bible, something that I never heard anybody talk about, mm-hmm. something that I didn't know myself. And uh, but you can look it up on the internet; it's everywhere. You can find it easily. So the song is written from the perspective of Judas, where he speaks about uh, being one of the twelve disciples, that he's proud of it, uh, seeing Jesus as his brother. And then the song goes in the, to, into the betrayal part. And then in the end, when Dave is doing the clean singing, Dave, our lead guitar player, he speaks uh, as Jesus to, uh, to, to Judas, uh, saying, please forgive me for what I did. I died for a greater good, and you were the chosen one. And then 
that explains the song, that explains where it comes from, and that is based on historical facts instead of just mocking the Bible. Wow, man, it kind of, that whole perspective, like, puts a whole spin on things because, you know, anybody can read and, and realize, you know, you know, the God of the Bible said, like, everybody is his children, right? He created everybody, but to use a vessel, you know, like Judas to kind of be like, hey, man, sorry, but you're kind of going to look like a bad guy <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. that, so that I can, like, do my thing. You know what I mean? That's um, with uh, that, that kind of makes me think, too, like with coming up with like a band name like, like God Dethroned. What has always been your mission of like God Dethroned? Well, it's been different missions, but um, you know, we started. I, 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 I came up with the name God Dethroned because I found it very strange that so many people had to die in the name of religion, in the name of God. Mm -hmm. uh, people were uh, burned, drowned, quartered because they believed in something else, or they were deemed to be a witch, or whatever you can think of. Um, so initially I was really anti-Christian that evolved more into anti-religious. Uh, you cannot do this, you cannot do that because the Bible says so. Um, so what I did, I took stories from the Bible, I made them more down to earth. That's how I saw it and I mocked the stories a little bit to make them to make them a story between you and me and not something on a higher level. Then at a certain point, I got I got fed up with that, and I started doing the the World War One themes. You know, I did we did three concept albums about World War One. That was a heavy task. So that when that was finished, we went back to the dark sides, as I call it. But this time, it's more like speaking about Illuminati, Freemasonry, uh, Egyptian mythology, um, conspiracy theories, and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, like I said, I, I don't want to do the same thing every time. So we, we want to broaden our horizon also with the lyrics, the topics, what have you. It's, I, I love, I love topics about like conspiracy theories. I love, cause it, it is interesting in our day and age, we are we can be fed by the masses just kind of like, Hey, this is what history is. Take it. But there's always, there's always another side to every story. There's always deeper, deeper things. And um, have you in your journey of just of digging into history and this, this creativity to turn music to make music around such topics have you ever like uncovered something that you thought to yourself, man, this isn't really taught, but I think this could be true. Like what's a big one? Well, the biggest one is definitely this one, the Judas paradox. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not taught. Did you know about it? I didn't. No, I don't know the Bible by heart, but I know a little bit. And, uh, and this was something that surprised me. And uh, it's not that important, perhaps. But I thought if everybody on planet Earth calls Judas a betrayer, then uh, I would like to know if that's really true. And it's a matter of perspective. But if you if you look at the Bible and you find the second story and you find out that that could also be true, then, then the guy is completely innocent. So I found that quite interesting. And I had to point it out. I couldn't resist yeah, no, it it really is because like I told you, I um I actually I was a missionary. I I lived overseas and was like somebody that actually spread the gospel when I was in my early 20s. And I was a, that was a big thing for me and um since then life has kind of gone a different direction for me. Um I really like wanted to open my mind to think and whatever. But there was a another thing that I was kind of curious since you're talking about this that made me think of there's like a gnostic teaching where the 
the God of the Old Testament is actually not the God of the New Testament. That the God of the Old Testament is actually uh, the the enemy or the the devil. And when I started kind of like digging into that, I thought, oh, this is really interesting because when you when you do look at the Bible, you look at like when you look at the Old Testament compared to the New Testament, you're like, are you bipolar or something? Because like Old Testament, you're killing kids and you're doing crazy shit. New Testament, you love everybody and you want to save everybody. Like, what the fuck is going on with this? Yeah, I never understood that. Uh, you know, not not every religion uses the 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 the, the New Testament. Yeah, uh, like the Jews and the Islam, they use the Old Testament only, and uh, the Christians use both. They use the Old Testament and the New. So, I don't know why. Not everybody uses the New Testament, so it is. It's 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 very it's very interesting, and it, and it seems also super geared towards um, the modern world. I I believe, like especially like over here in the in like the states, the New Testament is almost taken more than the old because we somebody could go over and say to somebody over here and say, "Well, hey, man." The Old Testament God did this. Well, well, you know, since Jesus happened, he just that he cancels out all the bad shit that happened. It is kind of dissected and kind of almost like disregarded in a way, or you're not looking at it through the lens of over here. They say this thing. Uh, if you read the Bible and you're look, if you're reading it, you're not looking at it. And if you don't understand it, you're looking, you're not being, sorry, you're not looking at it through the lens of the Holy Spirit. He's not helping you understand the message. So, like, if you read it and you don't get it, that's kind of your fault because you're not truly understanding. That's, like, a big thing, like, kind of over here, especially in the States, because people don't want to talk about the Old Testament. It's more, let's talk about the New. (laughs) I don't. I don't know. I, I don't know about Europe. Um, I really don't know. Uh, I'm not into that stuff on that level. I mean, I just, um, I just want to write about specific things, and um, I don't know about all the rituals and uh, the things that are going on within religion. I mean, if if people value the Old Testament only, or or both, or the New Testament more, I have no clue. I really yeah. don't have a clue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with this um with this new album, what is uh what was like one song that I know that what you wrote you love all, all the songs on this album. Was there one specific song that you were like, I really am curious to hear what people have to think about? There's a song called Hubris Anorexia. It's a song about confinement. It's a song about uh, living in confinement and only be set free if you're willing to accept an injection. It's referring to my time during COVID, where in Holland you were not allowed to go to public places if you were not vaccinated. Uh, You were not allowed to go to a shop. You were considered crazy if you didn't take the vaccination. You were considered uh, a conspiracy theorist if you had questions about the safety of the vaccination. So there was this group pressure of forcing people to do something that they had uh, suspicions about. Um, In my case, I took the vaccinations because I wanted to take every opportunity I got to be able to play live. Mm-hmm. There were not a lot of opportunities, but the ones that were there, I wanted to take. And um, so I got vaccinated and it made me very sick. I've been sick for a couple of years. Um, like like 3% of the population, which in, in this small country is like 200,000 people who, were, who are really ill because of the vaccinations. In the U.S., it's a lot more. 
Yeah. But you know, they try to hide it. They try to cover it up. They try not to uh, admit that the vaccinations are deadly to older people, uh, can make younger people really sick. Um, so that song is my, well, you can call it my protest song, if you will, to watch that situation. So that song is quite special because I never write about personal stuff, usually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did for this song because it's, it was something, I think it's something that many people can relate to. So when you listen to the song, it's got everything. It's, it's got a lot of fury in it, but it's also got hooks and it's got uh, a great atmospheric part in the middle and then the, the, the two guitar solos done by Dave and me. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs on the album. And uh, I'm wondering if people can relate to what I just said when they listen to the song, when they hear the music and the lyrics. Yeah, that was a what a crazy time, man. Um, my my sister ended up getting getting COVID, and they had to almost they were putting her on a list for a lung transplant. She was she was on oxygen for a year, and she all it all it took was being around like she just caught it, and it ended up, you know. Now I visited her recently, and and she is it's been three years and she's so sick you know and uh and that was the opposite I, I i don't think she took the vaccine but she just caught COVID back in the in the beginning and it just it's a very interesting and troubling i've been trying to reflect also on COVID as well about like what is some of the good that has come out of it but because it, it's hard to think that it's hard for me to view COVID in that lens of it. Not a lot of good came out of that situation in history. No, you know, I, I feel like it, it transcended more, even not just with physical sickness, but look at how social media has like kind of taken off. It's become, I feel like social media has had a big effect during the COVID process with it's a lot more toxic, you know, there's a lot more just negative things being put out there. People, I think they had all that time off and then it, you kind of, I guess, go stir crazy a little bit, you know, and you, you. Yeah. Pe people over here, people are really, they have a short fuse when they're driving their car. There's no patience anymore. When they're st standing in a queue, there's no patience anymore. Uh, life has gotten really expensive since COVID. Everywhere. Um, so people are struggling financially. People have been kept inside. In Australia, it's even worse. I did interviews with Australia, Australian media. And they said that in certain places, you could, they were only allowed to go out w one hour a day. And if you... Uh, I spoke to a guy who could not be vaccinated because he got very ill uh, during one of the earlier vaccinations and he couldn't take the, the booster shot. And then he lost his job because he was it was mandatory to have the booster shot, but he couldn't take it because it would kill him. Um, so, you know, and your, your situation with your uh, sister is terrible. Of course, it is. But to force people to do things or... Uh, have serious consequences if they don't do what you want that's also not good yeah it's 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 kind of like hey you don't have to do this because we're you're free but you better do it you know it's it is well, people if people have a choice if people thought they were be they were better off by with taking the vaccination that's a free that's a free choice but if you don't want it then you should also be able to 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 do to live a life as a normal human being. They already knew early 2021 that the mortality rate was 0.02% or even less. So there was no need to keep on vaccinating people. 
and to government. force people to take that stuff and and then getting all the people that are sick because of it that was unnecessary mm. and it's a personal thing i know but no i well, i was it, talking it, about it and uh, it's my it was my situation and it's i regret that i ever took the vaccination it makes it no it, it makes me like kind of reflect on just it's like the whole topic of somebody thinking they know what's best for us and kind of like trying to speak for us like no 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 don't worry just do this and this is going to take care of you and and again it, it can go into the topic of trusting the government trusting the the leaders of your country or whatever and I have a hard time with that. I don't really trust much people. You know what I mean? And and a government that says they know what's best for me when like in your situation has ended up Yeah, but being... thinking what's you know they they can think that they know what's best for me, but to force it upon me that's something else. And to call me crazy if I don't want it is something completely different. Uh if you had a perfectly a functioning a uh, perfect perfectly well functioning immune system then you 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 didn't need any any vaccinations as a matter of fact many people lost a perfectly well functioning immune system because of the vaccinations mm. and that's that's something they will never admit or maybe they have to one day but until now they they try to avoid that topic yeah how do you feel, do you feel like during that time, you, you've you obviously had a lot of time to think and a lot of time to process certain things. Do you feel, how do you feel like you've grown during those years? Oh, I, um, I had time on my hands, so I, I, I basically learned a new profession. I mastered my mixing process. So when the time came to record a new album, I was able to mix it properly. It's something I always wanted to do, and I did it, and I it's it turned out amazing. So I used it for, for good things as well. Um and I don't live in a bad place, you know, there's a lot of nature here, so I can I I could go outside and have walks in, in, in the fields and the forests here. Mm -hmm. So that's all fine. Um, but uh, not to be able to live a normal life was was weird, it was really weird. And not to be able to promote an album, we 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 released uh, the the Illuminati album a month before the pandemic, mm -hmm. and we managed to do one European tour. And when we came back, uh, within a week, the whole world came to a standstill, so we couldn't promote the album anymore. And it was that was really demotivating. Because when the time came to write a new album, I wasn't motivated to to write a new album, because I didn't get any of the energy back from the, from a live audience. All the energy that I put into the album, usually I get it back from playing live, so I get recharged to do another album. That part was missing, so that took a lot of energy to to be able to uh, find the strength and the motivation to write a new album. Yeah, it it makes me think with this whole it's it's like a new it was a new process for you because like you said you would normally get your your strength your energy from you know kind of going on tour and that would like flow into the process so that makes me even more excited to hear this because I know that it kind of seems like over these years of of what you've been through this album has been birthed kind of out of a different process yeah well yeah but you know let me tell you when we start writing a new album everything goes by itself so the fact that there's been a, a few tough years doesn't mean that uh the whole thing is different i just sit down take my guitar and and come up with new melodies and new riffs and then we just make new songs and that's what we did this time and we know that it has to be uh, different from the album before, 
we want to keep the same high level of playing, of composing, and that's what we did. So all in all, it just took a little bit longer. That's it. Yeah. When was it? Uh, when was it for you? When when music when music when it clicked with you, where you were like, dude, I wanna I wanna make it. When was that moment for you? You 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 mean when I started playing with the band or when like when when was when did it spark in you that desire to go you know what I think I want to create I want to create music oh very early on in my life I I started playing guitar when I was fifteen but I always wanted to play guitar a, lo- a long time before that but uh, anyway I started at fifteen I had my first band at seventeen so that creative process process was there from 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 the moment I, I touched the guitar of course I had to learn how to play guitar but as soon as I could I started creating my own songs I know nothing else so that's been a long time I, I was I wanted to ask you something about um a, a friend of mine knows you and uh he said you're talking with Henry. And I said, I am. He goes, you have to ask him about um, his album, Passchendaele. Yeah. Passchendaele was the first album we, we did about World War One. It was the first concept album. I We had a guitar player from uh, from Iper in Belgium, which was on the front line during World War One. So when I visited him on certain occasions, I would see all the war cemeteries, the war museum, the trenches, uh, the people, you know, re- the relatives of the people who had died there in the fields from England, Scotland and Ireland. They were, they were visiting the pubs in the weekends, you know, to go to the graves of their rel- relatives. And it was, all, it was all so impressive that I started digging into the history of World War One mm-hmm. uh, because it was it was a it's not an unknown war but in our country we were neutral so when, when I went to school they didn't teach us much about World War one so and I'm a history freak as you know so mm-hmm. I started digging into that war and it was so fascinating to read about it that I decided to to do an album a whole album about uh, about World War One, and Passchendaele is a nickname for a town called Passchendaele, which is close by to Iper, and that's where a lot of things happened. So that's why the album is called Passchendaele, and it's 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 the first concept album we did about World War One, and there weren't any other bands who did that at that time. So it was also an original idea, like I described before, how important yeah. it is to us. So that's that's the story behind it, and and the album Passion Deal is also one of my favorite God Dethroned albums. What is uh? What's some of the stuff that happened in Passion Deal that, like, what what was like a big thing that when you learned it, you're like, what, what, like you couldn't believe it. I, the that war, you know, not not much happened in a sense that it was not spectacular. People were stuck in the in the trenches, with just a couple of yards in between the trenches of the enemy. And people were sitting there in the mud for four years, and they were just shooting at each other, trying to conquer some some ground of the enemy, and and that's it. But the, the staggering amount of people that got shot over there—that's unbelievable. The there's a few m- memorial sites. One is the Menin Gate, which is a gate on the road to Menin. Mm-hmm. The gate has, I believe, fifty thousand names of missing in action soldiers. From the Commonwealth, then the Steinkot Cemetery, where there's the Australian soldiers buried, and there's a wall with I think twenty or thirty thousand names of missing in action soldiers from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, if you see that, it's it's unbelievable. It really makes you think what how that could happen. But there's so many people disappeared in the mud. Uh, over there because the, I think the ground was lowered with like uh, four meters which is like uh, 
I don't know. I don't know the the the, the U.S. metric system. Yeah, but, I understand. But yeah. it's it's like a hill would disappear because of the bombardments of the artillery. Uh, so that's what really happened. There. So the people who, who were stuck there com got completely blown to pieces by the art artillery. And uh, so there's immense amounts of people got killed over there, and and like seventy thousand, eighty thousand people are missing still. They never found them back. The imagery, man. I've never the way the way you're describing it. I've never thought of. Uh... I never thought of this like imagery before of how, you know, people that amount of people disappearing literally into the ground. Just whoa, I, I yeah, my brain has never like kind of thought of it that way before. So my I'm kind of like, what the hell, man? It's well, we, uh, know, look at look at Ukraine at the moment and the Russians. It's it's also like a stalemate uh fighting, a stalemate mm -hmm. war at the moment. So but also there. The amount of Russians that get shot every day, but also Ukrainian soldiers that get shot every day is also large numbers. It's the same kind of situation where people are stuck in trenches. And, okay, now they have tanks and airplanes and drones and whatnot. But in the past, they had nothing. They were just stuck in the trench. And then they tried to invent the, the, the tank, which came in 1916, I believe, and then the airplane and stuff like that. But they were just sitting in trenches and nothing would happen. And they would sit in the mud and the rain and have nothing to eat, nothing to drink. That was horrible. Man, we, um, where I live in the East Coast, I, I live in a, a little town in West Virginia. And there's a lot of history around here when, you know, when the states came to be and whatever, and there was, you know, the civil war was heavy over here, the revolutionary war. And there is a, a battlefield near me called Antietam battlefield. It's massive. And Antietam was, I believe recorded to have it, the, the single largest battle in one day, the most people died in one day in Antietam but I think in Gettysburg, it was like the longest battle that happened. But over here near me, Antietam, um, it's crazy, man, because now it is a – they got some of the same historical buildings up and houses, and you can walk these beautiful trails through the woods and, and everything. And by Burnside Bridge, where uh, the north the south ad – the north advanced on the south, all types of just – history like what you said and you're walking on this ground where men soaked it with their blood and uh now it is you know a place of peace in a weird way because people go there to sit and to think about things and and enjoy the beauty of nature not knowing that it is on a mass cemetery you know um it's a very interesting bizarre calming type place you know people go there to the run and exercise um and there is a very interesting story where um there's a there's a certain hill that they say is haunted and if you the hill is on an incline but if you park your car and put it in neutral that you'll start to go up the hill like oh, something really? is something's pushing you you and i both know it's probably something with the like a an illusion it, it seems like you're on an incline but you're actually it's just you know yeah. uh but it is very interesting because you're sitting there we've done it when we were kids we used to go there and we're sitting there and we're like looking up <laughs> why are we moving up the ghosts are pushing our car you know <laughs> I want to ask you, you, you've had a, an amazing journey, man, of following your dreams and creating music, dude. Like you have crafted and created just amazing stories of your life. What is, what's one thing that you hope people can, can take away from your music well, the music is purely entertainment. So all I want is people to enjoy the music if they're into it. 
just enjoy it. You know, I, I, I always thank the fans that have stayed with us for all those years, the people who are still with us and still enjoy our music. The people who are new to our band or new to our music, I, I would like to invite them to check it out. If you like diversity, you're on the right place. Um, you might like it, so go check it out. There's a new album out today. Hell yeah, man. Again, Henry, this was awesome. Thank you My for pleasure. taking that. I know you talk to a lot of people, so I do appreciate you taking a little bit of time to talk with me, man. And uh, it means a lot. My pleasure. And uh, hope to see you on tour next year. Oh, man. If you're coming to the States, I'll be there. Yeah, hopefully uh, March, April, something like that. Excellent. I will be looking out for it. I will. 